My guest tonight is, of course, a very talented actress who's appeared in numerous films and TV shows, including Mary Poppins Returns, The Newsroom, and Match Point. Now you can see her in the film Relic, which is available on demand. I am thrilled she's joining me. Uh, please welcome Emily Mortimer. Hi, Emily. How are you? I'm good. I'm very happy to see you. Um, you know, uh, let's first explain where you are. Are you outside of London somewhere? Are you in a rural area in England? I'm in a rural area in England, yes. Okay, I like that you're saying that <laughs> as if you really don't want me to know exactly where you are because you think I'm creepy. That's the way you said that. I do <laughs> slightly feel that way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <You> <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. in an area in the continental England, which includes Scotland, okay. It was the way you phrased the question. You said it like it was slightly sort of sinister where I might be. That's, <laughs> I think that's just how I come across to women and I apologize, it's not intended, but. Um, <laughs> well, but I'm in, I'm outside Bath. Outside Bath, okay. Yes. Um, is that, is that from Chaucer? I don't think on their way to Bath or they're coming back from, I forget. Okay, the wife of Bath, there's a wife of Bath yes. in Chaucer. Okay, I knew, I knew something was going on with Bath. Uh, there was a historical reference that I had to make. Um, yes, I'm very impressed. Uh, I, um, thank you, that's the reason I did it. Uh, I wanna ask you, first of all, I wanna point out that I did an interview with someone uh, on a podcast recently who was in England and I could see them, it was a Zoom call and we were chatting and it was in the morning for me and at one early in the, in the, in the Zoom call, this woman picked up a glass of wine and took a big swig and I thought, oh my God, she's an alcoholic. <laughs> I forgot that she was, it's nighttime for you. Is yes, right? in fact, in fact I, I'm not going, well, no, I'm not gonna show you what I've got beneath the, 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 the computer screen, but there's a whole, there's a bar basically at my feet. Well, feel free to drink. <laughs> I want everyone to be relaxed, especially you and, uh, <laughs> and so just, you know, it's fine. It's fine if you drink, because I will tell all my viewers that you are in London and it's a, it's the drinking hour where you are. Yes. You're allowed to drink. Yes, exactly, exactly. Don't tell them I'm actually in Palm Springs. <laughs> and, that you have, and that you have I'm a real- a whiskey bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna put that up, Palm Springs, eight o'clock a.m. And everyone's gonna think you have a big problem. Um, <laughs> Who are you staying with right now? Are you staying with family? Well, yes, I came. I came to see my mum and my uh, my sister who are here. I'm not actually in the same house as them, I'm, but um, yes, I came to see my mum, my chain smoking mother, who is assuring me that um, she's protecting herself from uh, coronavirus with the smoking, which she read on some dark web. Uh, protects you, she so she's got. She's gone from smoking a packet a day to now she's up to probably two packs because uh, she, she's convinced it's, um, it's saving her life. And, and she's read somewhere that in France, they even put um, nicotine patches on corona patients, which I, I actually believe, I think it seems very French, but I'm not sure that she's, uh, I don't know whether her theory is true. <laughs> and I keep saying to her, Mom, this is really worrying. Can you please stop smoking? And she says, darling, her answer is, darling, I don't have a dry cough. I've got a very fruity cough, which indeed, which indeed she does. <laughs> this is, let me jump in here and just all due respect to your mom. This is terrible advice for anybody out there. Uh, you do not want to be smoking to combat coronavirus. There's no evidence that, I mean, uh, listen, I don't want to get into a fight with your mom, but um, she sounds like no, the kind of person were... who always wants to be smoking coronavirus yeah. or no coronavirus. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, she's just upped it. She's just upped it a lot. And with and, and now she's she feels that she's totally within her rights to close all the doors and all the windows and, um, you know, expose us to sort of second degree lung cancer <laughs> while she protects her own health <laughs> by chain smoking. <laughs> Uh, now, I know you have kids. How are your kids doing with the quarantine in isolation? Are they okay? They've been really good. They've been very brave and much more kind of stoic in a way than anyone else. But um, there are the odd moments of 
lapses where me and my husband were in the were in I think we were upstairs and they were downstairs at one point in the midst of it all and we heard our daughter who's 10 say very loudly to our son who's 16 um can you stop farting in my face? I'm just trying to survive here. Which I felt just about summed up the experience <laughs> for all of yeah. us. I would prefer your mom's uh, cigarette smoke, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Starting to look really, really good to me. Uh, you know, a lot of people are worried about flying these days. And it's turning out that actually a lot of the airlines are being very good. It can be quite safe to, uh, to fly. Uh, because of all the precautions they're taking uh, with keeping people separated and being extra careful. But I know that you have a fear of flying even when there is no coronavirus. You've always been afraid to fly. Is that right? Yes, I'm terrified of flying, which is a big handicap given that I fly uh, all the time for my job. I mean, many times a year. And um, no, it's it's dreadful. I, I, I don't know what to do about it. And it's got me in terrible sort of pickles in the past because... I end up getting very confessional on airplanes thinking that I'm definitely plummeting to my doom and I need to kind of offload myself of all my deepest darkest secrets and uh, and then I don't die and um, and I've told some perfect stranger everything about myself and I did it once on a flight to Yalta I was doing um, I was doing a job in in Yalta in the, the ex Soviet Union and um, and uh, I was sitting next to a very nice man. And I, you know, those flights are terrifying. They're, 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 it was an aeroflot internal flight, which you're told that sort of, um, you know, people that work for embassies and things are banned from going on because I think on average about 20 people a week die on them because they're mainly driven by very drunk ex equivalent of RAF Russian um, yeah. pilots who get bored and sort of do loop the loops drunk uh, and then crash. <laughs> and um, and they were literally sort of- I like they were laughing, but if a drunk <laughs> pilot decides to do a loop de loop, it's hard not to giggle a little bit. Exactly. You know? Apart from when you're on the plane. Um, anyway, and so I got on this plane and there were literally sort of newspapers stuffing up the windows and kind of, there was like three, the safety precautions were three um, parachutes that were sort of, dotted around various places in the airplane and I just knew I was going to die. So I, I offloaded all my really sort of worst secrets to this very nice gentleman who was sitting next to me and then realized that he was in fact in the show that I was about to go and film this very sweet man knowing everything about me and, and, and winking knowingly whenever I sort of walked into the bar and I think, oh my God. <laughs> you knew <laughs> he everything. Was yeah, uh, your secret's safe with me. Well, guess what? I contacted that man and he told <laughs> me everything. And I want to ask you about it now. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a fun turn of events? Yes, it would studied, be amazing. You studied acting in Russia, didn't you? I did, I did. Well, I didn't really. I studied Russian at university in England and then I did a year abroad um, as a sort of uh, practice year. But I didn't learn anything because I went to drama school in in Moscow and uh, I just got a huge crush on the guy that was teaching me Russia uh, drama. Oh, act. oh, so really? That's, that's classic. Did. That's classic for people to get a crush on their instructor, you know, I know. especially when you're young and you're in a foreign country. What, what was this guy like? Was he very commanding, you know, sort of <laughs> impressive guy? He was called Dmitri Druznikian, and um, he was, well, in my mind's eye, he was all of those things. Um, but I, I don't know. I think love is blind, maybe. I don't know. But no, I'm sure he was all of those things. But I, uh, I yeah, just was obsessed by him, and I didn't get pick up any knowledge, either of acting or of how to speak Russian. But um, I did finally get him back to my apartment for oh. dinner with the, uh, I, you know, I, I staged this whole thing with, with the, the other students that had been on my course and I made this delicious dinner for everybody. And he did, lo and behold, walk out onto the balcony um, and start sort of looking up at the moon and talking about the moon and, and quite seemingly quite sort of romantic terms. But I unfortunately was so, drunk on um, vodka, because I was so excited that I had him in my house, that um, I started vomiting silently behind him into my, I knew I was going to be sick, but I didn't want to leave. <laughs> so I was sort of sick quietly into my hands behind him. So and a, the weird, 
<laughs> is, is he didn't notice. He was so engrossed in his, in his, yeah. in his sort of, he was waxing so lyrical at the moon that he didn't fail to notice me vomiting behind them. And I can't really remember how it played out, but it's sort of, I think I went off him that he didn't notice that he was so self-involved, he didn't notice me being sick <laughs> behind him. <laughs> uh, that's the least romantic story I've ever heard. <laughs> I know. You, uh, I, you're, uh, wow, okay. I like that you discreetly threw up, which is a very hard thing to do, in a very ladylike fashion. I did, I did. First of all, I keep getting distracted by your background because you say that you're in sort of a rural part of England and it looks like you're on the set of a quaint Agatha Christie murder <laughs> You know what I mean? I just keep, it looks like soon they're gonna gather you all in the room that you're in and try and figure out who the murderer is. It's actually, it is actually a backdrop, it's not real. Behind it is Palm Springs where I really am and it's eight in the morning and I'm drunk on whiskey. Okay, all right, <laughs> okay, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, I'm staying at a friend of mine's house and it is really beautiful and I do feel a little bit like I'm in an Agatha Christie or something. Yeah, I'm just suggesting that you might wanna murder someone while yes. you're just because it's I, the perfect place to do it. I agree, I agree. Um, you know, I was thinking about, you've done, uh, I want to talk about Relic, but I was just thinking today about, you've done so much good work and you've shown up in, in so many good projects. And I was trying to think of the first time I saw you and was like, who's that? I remembered you had a, a big break in, uh, what was it, was it Notting Hill? Was that, a, was that one of your early roles that you were in? Yeah, it was really one of my first jobs. And I uh, I was so delighted because I got this part and um, I, you know, it was a small part, but I was called the perfect girl. That was my character type, that was my name. I didn't actually have a name. I was just the perfect girl. <laughs> uh, I was never an actor, but I did go to one audition once for something for, I think it was the Henson Company or something. There was some show that they were looking for. And they said, we have a role you'd be perfect for and they sent over sides and there were two characters and they didn't tell me which one was who, for who. Yeah. And the two characters were the hunk and the geek. <laughs> <laughs> and I remembered reading the description of the hunk and then I remembered reading the description of the geek and it was like this tall, gangly goofball isn't exactly a winner with women, but he's, such, he's so silly that no one takes him seriously. And I went, oh. Okay, <laughs> I get it. I'm not the hunk. I I once had a part where they they said I only had like a couple of lines. I was playing a publicist again. I didn't have a name. I was just the publicist. I had a couple of lines, and then they said, and I was like, okay, well that's fine. I'll I'll do the part. And then they 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 rung up all excitedly my agent saying they've added to your part. There's some more. You know, it's it, there's another whole scene, and I was like, oh god, and I I flamed through desperately trying to find the rest of the part, but I couldn't see it anywhere. And finally, in the sort of small print scene description, I found one line that said, uh, "The publicist is hogtied and gagged in the corner." <laughs> that was... That's it. That was your action. <laughs> that was the great new addition to my role. Great. Well, hey, no lines to learn, so you have that going for you. Now, I wanna to talk to you about Relic. Uh, this is a scary movie. It's a great, it's a great mood piece. And it's, um, it, 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 one of the things that is, I would think difficult for an actor and you're a terrific actor, but I would think it would call for you to be, you're frightened almost all the time. And I would think that's not easy as an actor. It's very difficult. No, it's very difficult. I mean, I find it very easy to be scared in life. <laughs> I'm all often scared in life, but um, but to sustain, you know, and you can manufacture it for to a degree, but to sustain that level of fear for sort of four weeks straight is um, yeah, it's quite exhausting and quite depressing because you have to just keep conjuring up all these terrible sort of thoughts and feelings. What kind of things are you conjuring up? Like I've, you know. I've got a Zoom oh. interview across, across the pond with Conan O'Brien, that kind of raw terror. It is true, actually. Chat shows are one of my biggest fear, along with rats and fear of flying. Um, <laughs> I have a preternatural terror of chat shows, and I do think of them when I'm running yeah. down corridors in horror films. I could see, yeah, I could see you. I see the association between uh, going on a, talking to a talk show host and encountering a rat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I'm surprised you say that because uh, I was talking to someone today and, and I told them that, that I was gonna be talking to you. You're one of my favorite people to talk to because you're so natural. You're always yourself and you're always funny and entertaining. So I don't, I, I don't imagine you of all people getting worried before you do something like this. Well, you know what? I, I think part of the reason that maybe if I am uh, good to talk to is because I'm so um, sort of desperate to please that I will sell my grandmother basically for a joke. And so that makes me sometimes quite a good subject, but it often leaves me feeling slightly hollow and sort of ashamed afterwards. Not when I speak to you ever. You made me feel good about all the terrible things I, I uh, reveal about myself. You know why I think that's true? I think it's true because you and I are kindred spirits. I will sell anybody down the river if it's gonna get me a laugh. The only difference is I don't feel horrible afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> You're a better person than I am, that you have that feeling afterwards. I am a true sociopath. I just, <laughs> wow, that was a big laugh at the expense of my long dead grandmother. <laughs> it was all worth it. <laughs> all, all worth it. No, well, I do. I make it the, often they're at the expense of myself, which is mostly fine. But there are moments where it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I've got a bit far this time. I did that once with a. Um, I'm now going to do it again, but I feel like I'm older now. I can I can handle it. Yep. It was when I was in my twenties and I was being interviewed by a woman for the Observer newspaper, which is like a very serious sort of broadsheet. It's like the New York Times on yeah. Sunday, and I was desperately selling my grandmother and everyone else I know because she was one of those journalists that was sitting with her pen hovered above her paper, not touching pen to paper, sort of waiting for you to say something interesting. And then you get into panic, you more and more stuff comes out and waiting for the pen to touch the paper. And I, I started to, telling her a story. And even as I began the story, I was thinking, oh, why am I doing this? But the, basically, I can't really remember the story, but I know that the punchline was, ended with me peeing in myself in a car with my sister. <laughs> I got to the end of the story and she didn't laugh not, and her pen didn't hit the paper. And she went, she was, but there was about three seconds of horrified silence after which she said, um, out of respect for you, Emily, I shall never repeat that story. And I went, I went, <laughs> and I said, I'm gonna make her laugh. <laughs> See, that's the kind of thing you can channel when you need to be scared in in. Uh, yes, exactly. Wait, are you laughing at my acting? This is my my acting. This is me acting scared. That's it. <laughs> it's I'm like a I'm a silent film star. That's, a, that's <laughs> you know what I mean. I don't have your hair is looking terrified as you do that. Yeah, my hair is. I haven't cut it since the quarantine. And sometimes I just let it go, but sometimes when I'm uh, talking to uh, a, you know a, a guest that I am very excited to talk to, I make the mistake of blow drying it before I come on, and it puffs up in this humid weather, <laughs> and it becomes this thing, and then uh, you know it it's ridiculous, and I'm sure it's just terrifying, and also no, stru it it's structurally unsound. It's <laughs> Um, we have a clip from Relic. Uh, your character, I mean, you, feel free to set it up, but your character has come back to a house yes. where your mother was living. You don't yes. know what happened to your mother and there's, you're looking for clues and some eerie, uh, palpably sort of scary, tense things are happening that are giving you a bad feeling about it all. Is that a fair summation? It's, an, it's a beautiful summation. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> Let's take a look at this clip from Relic. Okay. Don't And I also uh, want to make sure that I mention uh, Don't Look Deeper, 
Yes. On Quibi. Yes. Uh, don't look deeper on Quibi that's coming out very imminently. And it's later, it's, this, it's later this month. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that I know more about your career than you do. <laughs> and I'm going it's to pathetic. find out. I'm going to find out where this house is. Not for any nefarious purposes. The worst thing I'll do is leave some scones at your door and then run away like an elf. That's the worst. I would love that. Yeah, I think you'd still find it creepy. I think. <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Uh, okay, uh, Emily, I love talking to you. I really do. This is a me this too. is a treat for me, and me um, it's really cheered me up. Yeah, I and I, I look forward to uh, seeing you in person uh, when all of this madness ends. Um, yes, uh, me too. And 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 yes, and let hope, let's hope my mother's proved right, and we can we'll all be chain smoking. I think. Listen, if you if we get one piece of information out of this, it's that. Uh, or two pieces of information out of this interview. Uh, it's that uh, Relic is is out there right now and that possibly, according to your mother, chain smoking is the best way to defeat COVID. Yeah, it's, it is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna take that clip and run that everywhere and you'll be arrested, I think with probably within the hour. Um, all right, Relic uh, is playing in drive-ins. That's so cool. Select theaters and available on video on demand. And Don't Look Deeper is streaming on Quibi starting July 27th. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, stay safe. And um, I think you can have a drink now because it's very late where you are. I'm t gonna have a huge drink. I'm gonna have a glug. It's only, it's just about noon here and that's when I get to start. So I'm gonna go. Good. Good, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad to hear it. You deserve it. <laughs> I do. Uh, have a great night and thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Here's the awkward sign off where we both look for the button. <laughs> Very unattractive look for me. Huh? Huh? Bye bye.